Venezuelan Vice President of Communications Jorge Rodriguez denounced the latest attempts by the US and Colombian governments to destabilize Venezuela. The United Kingdom now has the highest COVID-19 death toll in Europe and the second highest in the world. As of this Tuesday, the confirmed COVID-19 death toll on the African continent stands at 1,843. From the headquarters of Teddy Sir English in Havana, Cuba, this is from the South, I'm Katrina Goss. Venezuelan Vice President of Communications Jorge Rodriguez this Tuesday denounced that the governments of the United States and Colombia are taking advantage of the coronavirus pandemic as an opportunity to intensify attacks on Venezuela and attempt to sow chaos in the wake of the attempted incursions into the country. There are some clear elements. The first is the level of viciousness of a miserable state for a government like that of Donald Trump and his lucky duque to take advantage of the circumstances that have the world in the process of fighting a pandemic that has caused thousands of human lives as an opportunity to sow more chaos and violence in Venezuela. Rodriguez stressed that the Colombian government continues to allow its territory to be used to launch attacks against Venezuela. The government of Colombia uses its territory to organize, train and provide logistics to all those who seek to commit acts of violence and aggressions against Venezuela. From the establishment of the military camps for mercenary to the training and launch of a plan to assassinate President Nicolás Maduro with the consent of Iván Duque's government. And the Venezuelan Vice President of Communications revealed evidence of the links between opposition lawmaker Juan Guaido and U.S. military contractor Jordan Gordo, who signed a contract for the coup plot against the Venezuelan government. Hi, Mr. President. Nice to meet you. Uh, thank you for, for the effort, for the time, and the, all the, the effort for our cause. My pleasure. Yeah. Yeah, as we speak before, um, he we, we have uh, several meetings during these past weeks, and uh, I think we're ready to sign. You have the the contract in your hands, yeah. And, and uh, the thing that we have to do is uh, sign. He, he wants to see while you you're doing it. Uh, we said uh, before that we were having this um, uh, these documents by uh, uh, scanning, so we can print it here and and sign it back. Okay. Uh, and I think that we'll be ready uh, to start the, the whole thing. Okay. Um, are there any questions, Mr. President? Concerns? Uh, I know. A lot of concerns, but uh, we will do the right thing for our country. And we are in a very hard humanitarian crisis, and we have to resolve this situation. Okay? Right. So, with Sergio, uh, uh, all the Confidence, confidence uh, to me. So, anything you want to do the sign? Yeah, you, you can do the sign. Okay, he signed in every page. That, like I said, on my yeah. uh, just on the front. Yeah. And then he'll, he'll be signed in the last, the last one. Oh, great. Okay, the last page. Both Spanish and English. Okay. Eh, ¿Quién me envía eso? Eh, about the half an hour. Okay. Excellent. Eh, gracias entonces. Let's go to work. Okay, yes, sir. That's. <laughs> And Venezuelan authorities captured eight mercenaries this Monday in the town of Tua, Aragua State, as part of a second failed incursion into the country following the first attempt in the early hours of Sunday. Locals, members of the armed forces and police are working together to track down all the mercenaries who enter the country as part of the attempt to launch terrorist acts of destabilization. Among those captured is Antonio Sequeira, 
who headed the so-called Operation Gideon and who participated in the coup attempt of April 30th, 2019, along with opposition lawmaker Juan Guaido. On that occasion, the deserter of the Bolivarian National Guard was pictured alongside far-right fugitive Leopoldo Lopez and a number of other military deserters in Caracas. And also among the eight mercenaries captured by the local population this Monday are two US citizens named Luke Alexander Denman and Aaron Seth Barry. Both are US military veterans from Texas, contracted by a Florida-based security company called Silver Corp USA, and are associates of Jordan Gordo, linked to opposition figures JJ Rendon and Juan Guaido. Texas. Aquí. And Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro revealed further details regarding the two U.S. mercenaries captured on Monday. Here I have the, Denman the Luke passport Alexander. of Denman Luke Alexander, born on the 22nd of January 1986 in Texas. Here's the passport. Here are his driver license, his driver license, a war veteran. Here is uh, his ID. Here I have the passport of the other American mercenary member of Donald Trump's security, as they claim. Barry Aran Sepp, born on March 5th, May 15th, 1978, Texas, the United States. Uh, some of his IDs I have here, some cards uh, belong to him. Uh, we have that in our possession, his uh, vet war veteran ID. One of the mercenaries captured on Monday, Jonas Adolfo Badel, also admitted there were two U.S. citizens in custody. And he claimed that they had claimed to work for U.S. President Donald Trump. The group, there are two Americans, two gringos. They're detained now. Where do they work? What do they do with you all? They are intermediaries. They are part of the security team of the President of the United States. Of Trump? Who said that? Did they themselves say that? Repeat that. They say they work for the security of the President of the United States. Who is the President of the United States? And President Donald Trump claimed on Tuesday that the United States was not involved in the attempted armed incursions into Venezuela. I just got information, nothing to do with our government, but I just got information on that. So, we'll, well, we'll find out. We just heard about it. Uh, but whatever it is, we'll let you know. But it has nothing to do with our government. More stories coming up after this very short break, so don't go away. Welcome back to From the South. The United Kingdom now has the highest COVID-19 death toll in Europe and the second highest in the world, after new official figures revealed that more than 32,000 people have died from the virus. The Office for National Statistics said more than 29,600 deaths were registered in England and Wales by May 2nd, with COVID-19 mentioned on the death certificates. But with the addition of deaths in Scotland and Northern Ireland, this takes the UK's death toll to over 32,000. Of the coronavirus deaths registered up to May 1st in England and Wales, over 6,600 took place in care homes, representing 22.5% of all deaths from the virus by that point. This figure far exceeds the death toll in Italy, until now Europe's worst hit country. The United States has now seen over 1.22 million COVID-19 cases and more than 71,000 deaths, according to data from Johns Hopkins University. The worst hit states are on the east and west coasts, with New York State by far the main hotspot, although Michigan and Louisiana have also been hard hit. However, more than half of the 50 states of the US are now attempting some form of easing of lockdown measures, as President Donald Trump has declared success in America's fight against the coronavirus and continued to push for the economy to reopen. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the number of new cases in the United States could reach 200,000 per day by June, with fatalities expected to jump to 3,000 per day.
Italians began to enjoy more liberties on Monday as some restrictions on productive activities and personal movement were relaxed for the first time in almost eight weeks. The lockdown imposed on March 10th to contain the COVID-19 pandemic was partially lifted on Monday as the country entered the so-called phase two of restrictions involving the gradual assumption of social, economic and productive activities. Some 4.5 million people went back to work on Monday, adding to those employed in essential economic sectors that didn't stop during the lockdown. The novel coronavirus pandemic has claimed over 29,000 lives in Italy, while the total number of cases has reached over 213,000, according to the latest data released by the country's Civil Protection Department. Still, only some basic flavors are available. It takes time. Gradually, people will get used to wearing masks in the reopen shops and restaurants and keeping social distancing. I'm very happy. The first thing during the break of work is to take out my bicycle, change clothes and ride for a while before going back to work. Spain reported under 200 new COVID-19 deaths for the third day in a row this Tuesday. However, a record number of people claiming social security benefits for April and 60,000 people are unemployed show the economic cost of the measures to control the spread of the virus. According to official figures issued on Tuesday, 5.2 million people received unemployment benefits in April, representing 4.5 billion euros, the highest unemployment spending in Spanish history. Spain is gradually emerging from a strict lockdown, with small businesses reopening this week. The outbreak has killed more than 25,000 people in Spain, representing one of the world's highest death tolls. The number of new coronavirus cases in Russia has risen by more than 10,000 over the past 24 hours. According to its Coronavirus Crisis Response Centre, Russia has now seen over 155,000 cases and reported more than 1,400 COVID-19 deaths. Russia is now the world's seventh most affected country, having surpassed China, Turkey and Iran last week. Meanwhile, President Vladimir Putin has extended the national non-working month through May 11th as Russia continues to see sharp daily rises in new cases. Moscow's strict coronavirus lockdown has also been extended until May 11th. China has pledged to increase funding for multiple international initiatives to combat the COVID-19 pandemic and to strengthen health cooperation to prevent a future crisis. According to local media, the Chinese representative to the European Union, Zhang Ming, announced new donations from his country on Tuesday, as well as the active participation of China in initiatives such as the UN Global Humanitarian Response Plan and the WHO programmes related to the development of vaccines. Ming also mentioned that Beijing has implemented a special fund of $283 million to combat the coronavirus, while the country will also provide materials worth $2.5 billion to more than 150 states and organisations worldwide. World leaders and organizations have pledged $8 billion to research, manufacture and distribute a possible COVID-19 vaccine and treatments. However, the United States has refused to contribute to the global efforts. Leaders from the European Union, the United Kingdom, Norway, Saudi Arabia, Japan and South Africa, as well as dozens of other countries, joined a virtual pledging conference on Monday. Governments aim to continue raising funds for several weeks or months to turn around the haphazard initial response to the pandemic around the world. EU officials said pharmaceutical companies that receive funding will not be asked to forego intellectual property rights on any vaccine or treatments, but they should commit to making them available worldwide at affordable prices. EU diplomats confirmed that the United States, which has the world's highest number of confirmed COVID-19 cases and fatalities, was not taking part in the initiative and declined to say why. During today's event, some 7.4 billion euros was pledged for research and development for vaccines, diagnostics and therapeutics. This was a powerful and inspiring demonstration of global solidarity. Today, countries came together not only to pledge their financial support, but to also pledge their commitment to ensuring all people can access life-saving tools for COVID-19. And we're taking one last break now, but stay with us for more. Welcome back to From the South. As of this Tuesday, the confirmed COVID-19 death toll on the African continent stands at 1,843. 
According to the Africa Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, more than 47,000 cases have been confirmed so far. South Africa continues to be the hardest hit country in the continent with more than 7,200 cases and 138 fatalities, while Egypt closely follows with over 6,800 cases and a death toll of 436. Morocco ranks third with more than 5,100 cases and 180 deaths, while Algeria takes fourth place with over 4,600 cases and 465 fatalities, representing the highest death toll on the African continent. Of Africa's 54 countries, only the Kingdom of Lesotho has yet to report a single case of the virus. Uganda began to loosen one of Africa's strictest lockdowns on Tuesday after President Yoroli Museveni declared the infection had been tamed. Uganda, alongside neighbouring Rwanda, had some of Africa's strictest lockdown measures, including the closure of all but absolutely essential businesses, curfews and bans on both pu private and public transport. Schools and international borders are to remain shut. According to Museveni, after a 14-day period, authorities will announce the next level of reopening. COVID-19 cases and fatalities reported across Africa have been relatively low compared to other continents. Uganda has 97 confirmed cases and no deaths during the 45 days of restrictions. The government of the Democratic Republic of the Congo has warned of the large-scale spread of COVID-19 after around 100 inmates of a military prison tested positive for the virus. According to a cabinet meeting press release issued on Tuesday, contamination at prisons could lead to a large-scale outbreak due to their overcrowded conditions. The first case of the coronavirus in the Central African country was registered on March 10th. Since then, 705 cases have been confirmed and 34 deaths. India has seen its largest ever one-day jump in COVID-19 cases and fatalities. 195 people succumbed to the disease in the space of 24 hours, while nearly 4,000 new cases were reported. The surge in figures came between Monday and Tuesday, bringing the total number of cases in the country to more than 46,400 and the death toll to over 1,500, according to data published by the Health Ministry. Over 14,000 patients are located in Maharashtra, which remains the worst hit state of the nation. Though India has been under a nationwide lockdown since late March, New Delhi and regional governments have permitted some shops to reopen before the quarantine measures expire. Iran on Tuesday announced that the number of confirmed coronavirus cases had reached almost 100,000, following a rise in new cases after a brief drop in recent days. According to Iranian Health Ministry spokesman Kianush Jahanpour, another 1,323 people tested positive for the virus in the last 24 hours. Last weekend, Iran's new daily infections hit their lowest level since March 10th, but they have picked up again since then. Iran has reopened mosques in part of the country deemed low risk from the virus after allowing a phased reopening of some businesses since April 11th. Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas said on Monday that if Israel persists in annexing parts of the West Bank, existing agreements with Tel Aviv and Washington will be annulled. During a special virtual summit of the non-aligned movement on Monday, Abbas reiterated that if Israel annexes the Jordan Valley and part of the occupied West Bank, Palestine would be absolved of all obligations, agreements and understandings with that country and the United States. The Palestinian leader also urged the international community, the United Nations and its Security Council to prevent the Israeli regime from taking advantage of the coronavirus pandemic to continue with its plans for annexation. Finally, Aras called for the immediate release of Palestinian political prisoners in Israeli prisons, holding Israel responsible for their safety. And we've come to the end of this news brief. You can find these and many other stories on our website at telesoenglish.net. And join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. For Telly English, I'm Katrina Goss and thank you for watching.